It's a new day, and with cautious optimism, we rise once more, setting forth on a new and different journey. I'm Jeff Oppenheim, filmmaker, content creator, digital journalist, and storyteller. Join me for tomorrow's journey. Today's journey brings us farther down the path of love particularly because we just got done celebrating a Valentine's Day in the midst of COVID. And because of that, and we hope you watched that episode, by the way, if not, click on through when you get done with this episode. They go very well together, kind of like a hand in glove or a really happy couple. But we wanted to seriously examine relationships in this time just a little bit deeper and a little bit more substantively than certainly my expertise allows. I share with you a little bit of my journey, as I do in most episodes. Last February, I found myself reaching for this book, <laughs> Love in the Time of Cholera, and it's by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And it is such a timely read. If you haven't read it, you should pick it up. It's really a wonderful book. And if you have read it, like myself, it is great to go back to, particularly in this age of COVID. One of the things that I particularly love about this book is, well, as the title suggests, love is a central theme. It's almost its own character within the book, in fact. But it is the lens by which we examine and evaluate, if you would, our perception of each of the characters we meet. And the other similarity, of course, is the obvious one. They were living with cholera we are living with our own COVID pandemic. And as I reread it, there was something else that stuck out. And I think it was particularly irksome just in my own journey of going through the separation with my soon-to-be ex-wife. But I want to share the quote with you, and that is, always remember that the most important thing in a good marriage is not happiness but stability. Stability? I don't know. I push back on that. Well, I push back on it because, as you might know from watching the last episode, I am a self-professed romantic. Voila. And I don't know if I want that to change, even going through life's twists and turns. But I decided maybe in this age of COVID, maybe things had to be looked at from a different perspective. And I reached out to a good friend of mine, professional therapist, and she focuses a lot on relationships and couples. Her name's Valerie Keim. I actually had the pleasure of meeting her and interviewing her for the Foreign Press Association about a year ago when we wanted to look at the state of mental health under the pandemic. So it seemed like a good time to turn back to her when we're all living life and love under the age of COVID. Valerie, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, Jeff, thanks for having me on board. I really appreciate being here today. It was about a year ago that you and I first sat down, it was the midst of COVID, still early on enough, but here we are almost a year later. And although we have the vaccine in hand, we still are all bracing for what could be an extended stay, as it were. I want to really drill down on what you were concerned about back then and how has that changed, if it even has, since we last spoke. The main things, you know, played out as we thought they would. You know, there's an increase in anxiety, depression, substance abuse. That was fairly predictable. But there's uh, three artifacts, three byproducts of the pandemic that I missed by a mile. The first one uh, actually is something we've all asked at least once a week, which is, what day is it? What time is it? And that has to do with temporal disintegration. Everybody's lost their sense of time. Time accordions in. It feels like six months ago was six days ago. It skitters out ahead of us. You know, something we thought was months down the road has suddenly arrived in our faces. It's been a, a really, uh, a tough thing to manage for a lot of people, you know, and that's a really a byproduct of losing the regular markers of time that uh, we traditionally use. Going to our place of faith once a week, going to the coffee shop with our friends every Tuesday, that kind of thing. 
with that uh, eroded, our sense of time also erodes. It's really quite remarkable to think about. The second thing that I missed by a mile is the baby bust. I would have predicted that we'd be in the middle of a baby boom at this point, you know, with alcohol consumption being up by 50% and being locked in with your loved one. But instead, the opposite has happened. You know, the birth rate has significantly dropped in 2020. And um, we're watching to see where it goes this year. Explain that. There's too much constraint, too much stability, too much being locked in. Uh, libido is down as a result. Arguments are up. There's just been, if I can say this, uh, really just too much uh, nagging and not enough shagging in the bedrooms of America. And the third thing that I missed actually is a really curious phenomena that has to do with how the pressures of the pandemic have created a pathway to the phenomenal, unprecedented rise of uh, people, uh, uh, membership in, in uh, conspiracy cults. It's really taken off in a big way. The phenomenal you know, progression of this is something I don't know if anybody could have seen. You know, over a million people have joined uh, QAnon at this point in this country. Absolutely staggering figures. But you think about it, under stress, we regress. And, you know, we're moody, we're irritable, we're listless, we feel a bit of helpless, hopeless. And our thinking, when we're like that, it gets kind of more black and white, more concrete. We're not getting instant answers from the sources we normally do. So what do I do late at night? We're on the internet looking for answers. There's hundreds of people who are uh, there with answers. And then you look a little further and it's not hundreds, it's thousands. And you go further and then there's tens of thousands of people who are giving you answers that make as much or more sense than what uh, Fauci might be telling you or what your local news uh, station is telling you or what your doctor is telling you. So you start to pay attention, you start to listen. And these people understand you, their friends, their neighbors, their fellow Americans, and that grows like that. You know, it's, it's a buy-in that works for you. It helps solve the problems and settle the matters. And you've got, you know, your, your problems, your issues are held in a new perspective now. So you feel more confident, you're getting better sleep, and you've got a lot of new friends, a new brotherhood, a new sisterhood, of people who feel and think and uh, just like you and understand things just like you. That's very, very compelling. So that is the third thing that I missed by a mile. Well, certainly one of the most rational explanations I've heard about something as irrational as QAnon. But I want to harken back to what you were talking to when you were referencing the impact on relationships. And specifically, do you think there can be some long-term fallout on relationships going forward well after COVID? Yeah, well, I believe that um, the baby boom will continue. I believe that uh, temporal disintegration will go away as the pandemic uh, uh, slowly winds down. And I think that, you know, as long as belonging to a big online group uh, serves people, they'll be a part of it. When it no longer serves them, many will drift away. But there are repercussions. There are repercussions. Um, you know, family members don't understand you. Other people may judge you. It can create rifts in your current social network, you know. But that's a function of time. And the other function of time of what's uh, been really difficult with uh, COVID is, you know, it's gone on for so long, you know. And our personal fault lines are beginning to crack more and more, you know. And in terms of relationships, relationships that are doing well and caring and loving have become more so. Everything gets amplified. It's like a greenhouse effect, you know. Um, you take a relationship out of its natural social environment and stick it in a quarantine. It's kind of like taking a plant out of the wilderness and putting it in a greenhouse. Um, under those constraints, it's going to blossom, but without the normal balancing vectors that would uh, limit its, uh, its productivity, if that makes sense. Well, Valerie, we've been talking now more about aspects of relationships that have been in essence laid bare. 
But are there any concerns for some issues that may be masked, in fact, because of COVID? I believe so. I know very well how good couples can be. Even the most uh, conflictual couples can be at pulling it together and presenting a fabulous face to the world, you know. We certainly see that on Facebook. People don't post their dirty laundry. They post the best and brightest of themselves. So absolutely that's true. I know in the realm of social work, uh, the number of reported child abuse cases, which usually, you know, occurs in the home from a known loved family member, they're way down. It's just not being reported in 2020. And social workers are concerned about that. So there's other markers like that that uh, indicate that, of course, there's more going on than we know about right now. But again, it's a function of time. It's a function of being closed in. When things open up, when we can meet in person, when we can confide in person with our friends and blow off steam in other ways, I think a lot of this, these issues will uh, automatically begin to heal and clear up on their own. We hear a lot about pandemic fatigue. And I'm wondering, can that have added impact on our relationships, not only inside the house, but outside as well? Oh, that's a great question. Pandemic fatigue is so real. You know, you see what plays out like with the workplace, you know, your home workplace and the pandemic fatigue plays out in relationships too. You know, people have such a hard time concentrating, focusing, getting the work done, showing up on time. There's this lack of enthusiasm that is, uh, you know, uh, systemic and pervasive at work and in relationships. You know, really, you can look at relationships as uh, on a pendulum. We need both stability and predictability, and we also need the other side of the pendulum, which is novelty, adventure, fun, surprises. And the problem of the pandemic is we're kind of frozen up in one swing of the pendulum, and not enough of the other side of the pendulum is available to us right now. And that's, uh, that's the big relational problem with pandemic fatigue. Well, we, in fact, just did a broadcast, I guess, as a precursor to our interview today, Valerie, where we gave advice in time for Valentine's Day on how to be a little extra romantic these days. I'd like to think of it particularly going out to the uh, male energies of the species because I think they need a lot more help in learning to do things romantic and making those little subtle gestures that mean so much to the female energies. So I have to turn to you and say, do you have recommendations? Do you have ideas for couples during this time to keep the heat there, as it were? The way I'd look at it is like this. You can always get to know more about your partner. We barely really know ourselves thoroughly, let alone our partner. So they can be an endless font of surprise, of novelty. You just have to ask the right questions, you know. Um, if your relationship right now is in a good enough, okay place, but you want to disrupt that sense of constraint and boredom, you know, ask some questions. You know, I saw in the news this week that lovely 117 year old nun celebrated her birthday with a glass of wine. And how, how cool is that? You know, so think about what if you and your partner lived in full health to 110, what's on your bucket list? What are you going to do for each decade? in the years to come from where you are now. What would you do? That's a great icebreaker, you know? Another fun one for now is simply ask, if you were 18 again, in the chronological year that you were 18, what would you do different knowing what you now know? How would you want your life to play out? Or if you were 18 today, knowing what you know, where do you want your life to go? What different decisions would you make? You, know, you can have fun with questions like that. And since both stability and novelty are important in relationship and gratitude is the glue that, you know, brings us together, you can take a piece of paper, two columns, and on one column you write down three things you do to contribute to the stability of your relationship. Every Saturday morning I vacuum. Every Sunday morning I bring you coffee in bed. I balance the checkbook every Wednesday night, you know. Um, three things you do to bring novelty and adventure. I'll come up with a new sex technique every couple of weeks that we try out. I always surprise you with new concert tickets. 
I love to take the kids out and leave you alone in the home so you can have some space to yourself every now and then. That's what I do to bring novelty, adventure, fun into our lives. And then you write down what you're grateful for. What three things does your partner do to bring stability into your relationship? What three things does your partner do to bring novelty, fun, surprise, adventure into your relationship? What are you grateful for? And you each do that and you share your lists with one another and that can be a lot of fun. If your relationship is not in such an okay place where that would be a difficult thing to start, I love to start with the idea of uh, an empathy exercise. Look at if you're not talking, if things have soured, if the pandemic has really left you high and dry, write down a list of five, ten things that, you know, how you feel miserable. I'm grumpy, I'm sad, I'm hurt, I'm frustrated, I'm fed up. Write them down on a piece of paper. Get it from your head out onto paper. And then take a wild leap of the imagination, of your empathic imagination, and write down how you think your partner feels. And that can be a tough thing to do in person. It can be a tough thing to do verbally. But on your own, write it down. And then when you've got a quiet moment, um, set the stage and share that with your partner. Say, look. I know this has been a hard time for both of us. I know I've been part of the problem some of the times, but I just want you to know, I think this is how you may be feeling too. And then read off, not your side of the list, but theirs, how you think they might be feeling. And uh, even if you get half of it wrong, it doesn't matter. They'll be so grateful that you tried. They'll be so happy that you're uh, emotionally tuning into them, even during the bad times. And just leave that empathy hanging in the air. Don't try to explain it. Don't try to defend yourself. Don't get into any of the stories that are behind what you wrote down. Just say, I just wanted to leave that with you. I'm thinking about you. Even though this is tough and we're having a hard time right now, I care about you. And uh, I got to, you know, it's my time to go uh, hit the gym. I've got to go on the Zoom right now. Just leave that there um, and let it sink in, you know. I say leave the room, and the reason for that is you want your partner just to kind of soak that in. You don't want to go, oh, yeah, and now let me tell you what's wrong. You want to avoid that, you know. So timing is super important with something like that. That's a good one to do, you know. And if you're part of the group that just isn't feeling very romantic, very intimate, if that's not drawing you right now, there's some easy ways to start. And that is just to give your partner a 10 minute uh, shoulder and neck massage. And I say shoulder and neck because you're not facing each other when you do that. You're there in a chair and they're behind you. And it's less triggering, it's less upsetting, it's more impersonal. And sometimes you need to start with more of an impersonal beginning uh, so you can warm up to more. And keep it short, you know, the more difficult it's been, the less you're talking to each other, the shorter the massage should be. Because you don't want to get triggered. You want to stay in that sweet zone where you can have good physical contact without getting too riled up. And if you need to, do it while you're watching TV, you know, because that's a bit more uh, low voltage, you know. And if you're feeling better, put on good romantic music and no TV and make it a little bit longer while you're working on your partner's shoulders and neck. We could all use that because we're spending way too much time in front of the screens right now. That's a good nonverbal icebreaker to get your relationship back on track, you know. And another one is really key, and this works well for people who are less verbal rather than more, more verbal, that is you've got to remember 80% of our language, our communication is nonverbal communication. So you can use that to your advantage. If you're talking to your partner, don't talk like this with your shoulders hunched and protected in your arms. It's too closed off. Relax your shoulders, open your arms, have broad, expansive gestures. Uh, if your partner's talking to you, don't turn away. Stay focused, make eye contact, smile with them. And if you've got your hands, you know, make your hands uh, not on your hips, that can be confrontational. Hands relaxed, soft in front of you. You know, it sounds super simple, but it's really powerful. So try it, try it first, see what kind of results you get. 
So those are some of the things that are helping couples to get through the rough times today. I hope that's helpful. Well, and the tip I'd like to share, I'll admit that I love to dance and I've been dancing up a storm <laughs> this entire time. Nothing better, not only as a personal workout, but also as grabbing your partner and cranking up the music. Maybe not so enjoyable for the neighbors upstairs or downstairs, so you have to find a happy balance. And then just dancing. It's just such a great way of being together and moving together and enjoying each other's energy. I'm all for that. That's fantastic. And you can start that from any emotional space that you're in. If you're in a good mood, it's going to make you feel better. If you're in a better mood, it's going to make you feel very romantic and amorous. If you're in a sour mood and put on your partner's favorite song or favorite group, you've got their attention because they know you're caring about them and paying attention. And if you start dancing first, don't wait for them. You go first. Going first is super important uh, during the pandemic. You know, because if you're waiting for your partner, you're giving them control over your direction, your intention. And you want to step out of that one down victim mode and turn the music on first, start doing a silly dance, a romantic dance, anything you want. They're going to crack a smile. They're going to laugh. They're going to come move towards you rather than away from you. That's a great idea. I love that. Thank you for adding that to the mix. Well, Chris, Valerie, we've been talking a lot about relationships, as in people already in them during COVID. But let's talk about those that might have just been starting in the dating realm and just beginning a relationship, uh, even semi-demi now sanctioned to a long-distance relationship. What advice can we offer them? I've seen a lot of couples form up during the pandemic, and I think they're going to last. I don't see frivolous dating. I see serious dating. You have to really want to find your person, your partner, during the pandemic to take the risk of dating at all. And uh, it's been wonderful to see how that's progressed. People spend a lot of time talking, Zooming. Uh, they have to be very serious about health, the consequences they make when they do get together. Um, and that's where the commitment comes in. I will not date anybody else for two weeks. I'll take a COVID test and then, yeah, let's meet in person. And it's wonderful to see. You think it wouldn't be possible, but quite the opposite is true. People are kind of stripped away the, the veneer. They're being very authentic with one another now in a way they hadn't before. I know when my own partner and I have been long distance uh, way too much during the pandemic, we've discovered we can watch TV together. You know, I open a Zoom call, I do share screen, he comes onto my screen, I got a, a YouTube movie playing, and we can comment and watch together. And that's been a really cozy thing to do. Other couples have been uh, watching, learning about relationship and couples and talking about it and getting down to the brass tacks. I highly recommend a couple of downloads. One is Esther Perel's Rekindling Desire. It's a great downloadable uh, program for couples who want to get together or deepen their relationship or heal their relationship. And a couple of others are from Terry Real at Relational Life Therapy. He's got one called Fierce Intimacy. It's fabulous. He's got a, a two-part series called Making Love Work. And it's for couples of all ages and phases. It'll get you on board, lined up, loving one another, communicating in ways that you never dreamed that you could. And now let's turn our focus to, well, let's say teens, for example, who I can't imagine coming of age during the time of COVID. I know what kind of a teen I was, certainly, and I don't know how I'd suffer through this. So what advice can you give to them? My empathy and sympathy goes out right when you're launched. You want adventure, excitement, autonomy, freedom, independence. Try on a lot of different roles, you know, go places, do big things. You're constrained and that's hard. But the lesson you're learning about our essential interdependence and how the choices we make have consequences that just don't affect us, they affect in a ripple fashion many, many people around us. And that raises your social and emotional IQ in a way that's going to serve you your entire life. This pandemic slowly winds down and you do get to get out there and live the big, bold life that you deserve to have. You're going to take that with you. 
And how about to the parents of these teenagers? What advice would you offer them? Oh boy, you know, the number one thing, just listen. I know almost every parent out there knows this and practices it, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but just listen to them. Don't admonish, don't minimalize, don't say that's silly. Just listen, let them pour their hearts out to you as they form more of an adult-adult relationship with you. You know, this is since they're having to mature in such a quick way, that means you've got a developmental task as well. You've got to kind of catch up with where they're now at. They're, because of the pandemic, there's this great window of opportunity that normally wouldn't be available to you. So just listen. How our kids are going to get through this, whether they're 2, 12, 22, you know, a lot of that's up to us as parents. It's up to us. Are we going to help them to shape narratives of heroism, empowerment, the sense of calm competence and confidence and how they got through this? Or are we going to allow them to sink into victimhood of misery, of having stories of being one down and powerless and helpless and miserable during this time. It's up to us to shape that. And the third really super important thing for all parents to remember is, of course, our kids are watching. They're taking in what we do, how we react, what we say. And they're forming an internalized template of how to handle tough times. And someday in their own lives, when they hit a wall, when they have a really hard crisis, they're going to remember how you handled 2020 and 2021. And that's what they're going to rely on. And that's what they're going to use to help solve their own crises. Of course, as we all know, we're never just parenting for today. We're also parenting for 10, 30 years down the road for our kids. Valerie, when we do talk about relationships, of course, we're thinking of the ones at home, but we really carry that forward outside and into the community. So is there any advice to offer there? One thing I've been so impressed with is uh, the ritual of masking and how we wear masks and how that's affected our nonverbal communication and our sense of courtesy. You know, we're such an extroverted people us Americans, and especially here in California, we've got to be the most extroverted culture on the planet. And what I've noticed when we mask is that part of our face is closed off. And so we have to express ourselves in other nonverbal ways, going in and out of doors to the grocery store, passing one another on the street. I've noticed there's a, an emphasis on body language and courtesy and uh, the way people go around to give you your extra six, eight feet that you need. And I see it play out, I do a lot of walking, and you know, uh, where I walk, people don't wear masks until they get within, uh, the bubble is about 30, 40 feet away. Then we look at each other and one starts and the other person puts their mask up. This is lovely courtesy of the signal. I care about myself and I care about you and that action is one and the same. You know, my taking care of myself is also taking care of you at the same time. Then we pass, we wave, you know, and we go on to the next uh, uh, orchestrated signal of our caring interdependence. It's quite lovely. Valerie, I know when we were talking before the interview, you described relationships, and I want to quote here, you described them in a very particular way as a, quote, important national resource that must not be ignored, end quote. Explain that. Oh, well, I'm going to quote Esther Perel on that one. She says, the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our lives. And the science is really clear about this. You know, more connections we have that are authentic and uh, based in honest emotions and caring, the longer we live and the better our mental health is. You know, the first mind-blowing study was started in the 20s at Stanford. And long after those graduates had passed, they did a factor analysis and weeding out everything else aside. Those Stanford grads from the 20s 
who had the highest number of close emotional connections, lived longer and lived healthier. Amazing. The study came out a couple of weeks ago that showed that partnered couples in their 90s had a greater cognitive ability and were healthier than their peers who were single. Certainly we know that children who are hugged, rocked, cuddled, sung to, uh, have better health, better emotional health, and 50 years later are, are far healthier than their peers that don't have that. And little infants who aren't held and cuddled as much as they should be are far more vulnerable to mental illness like schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder. It's really quite amazing. Uh, there's a great book that is uh, making a buzz right now by the 19th Surgeon General of the United States, Vivek Murthy, and it's called Togetherness, and it's actually about the impact of loneliness. And I loved what he had to say about it. You know, he said, no, it's a, a big problem. He sees it as the biggest mental health problem out there uh, because it affects our physical health so much. And he thinks there's a stigma about loneliness, and I couldn't agree more. But he wants to put that on the table. He sees loneliness today as being as uh, shameful a topic to bring up as mental health disorders were 50 years ago. Mental health has really come out of the closet. He wants loneliness to come out of the closet, too, so we can all talk about it and find better ways to re-knit our communities. To that point, there are a lot of folks that don't benefit from that right now during COVID. They're very much alone. So uh, how can we guide them in terms of being more social, more outgoing, as well as what would the pointers would you say to us as a community that should be mindful of this to reach across, as it were, to neighbors, friends, and family? First of all, absolutely. Keep a mindful eye out for those people, you know? We gotta take care of each other, you know? We've been through a rough time together and there's a lot of haves and a lot of have-nots. A lot of people who are more lonely. So reach out, try reaching out in a way you never have before. Make it an experiment, a one-time experiment. You probably find you get a lot of joy from it. It's gonna make you feel good to connect with others you know, like that. Um, you know, each older generation is more isolated, you know, each passing decade, it seems, from the pandemic. There's a website I really like, it's called Stitch. It's for people over 50 to find people just like you in your neighborhood who have the same interests you do. And it's been a lifesaver. You know, it's a great point of entry for making community, making friends, finding that kind of connection during COVID, so as things slowly open up for us, we can then kind of expand out and find our way into a, more of a community than we left behind. Do you think what we've experienced with relationships during this period of time offer a valued opportunity for better behavior <laughs> coming out of the pandemic? One of the consequences of COVID is uh, kind of based on the old adage, you know, absence makes a heart grow fonder. And I've seen a tremendous outpouring of caring and appreciation and attention to others. I've seen people reach out to people they wronged a decade or two ago and say, you've been on my mind, I've been thinking about you. So sorry for what happened back then. Um, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do to help out? I've seen real atonement happen again and again. I've seen many people reach out to childhood friends, friends they haven't connected with in a long time, and reestablish those bonds. I've seen acquaintances become deep friends through Zoom and some friends fall away, but there's a sense of mindful heart connection and really valuing the connections and friendships that we do form and do have. And my hope is that will be a new habit of gratitude that will stay with us long after the pandemic is over. You know, out here in California, Jeff, you know, everybody remembers uh, being through the big earthquakes. And when that happens, there's this drop that happens like instant in society, where all of a sudden we're not city dwellers anymore, we're inhabitants of a small country village. Everybody looks one another in the eye. Everybody says, how are you doing? You okay? And it's quite lovely. And it lasted, usually lasts, you know, maybe three, four days, a week tops. And then we kind of zip ourselves up and speed ahead and ignore our neighbors and our friends. And 
one thing I've noticed through this pandemic is this extended opening. It's a mindful heart-based practice that people have automatically fallen into where we are more caring and more open with one another. We have to be, our survival depends on making sure the person around us is healthy, is masked, is okay, is not in trouble. And I hope that great inter sense of our interconnection continues long after COVID leaves us. You know, a habit formed over a year is more likely to stick than the, the quick flash of the earthquakes where it's uh, over and done and then we resume our normal life. I'm hoping that that is a habit that remains. Are there any issues, concerns, good or bad, that you think we have to safeguard, uh, in essence, with a now generation that's coming of age in the time of COVID? There's probably a couple of things to look out for. One is a sense of um, emptiness. You know, you hear combat vets coming back and cancer survivors say the same thing. You know, my life was on the line. I never felt so alive. I really had to fight hard. I was electric every moment. Life, normal life now seems so dull, so empty. We may find some of that. Some people, as much as this has been a struggle, may find their lives more empty after this, more despondent. Right now, we all have a direction and a focus to get through this. That focus is removed. Some people might find emptiness. Another thing to look for is delayed reaction. You know, all of us have been kind of going, <gasps> and holding our breaths, waiting for, you know, the next step to happen. And, uh, you know, delayed reaction to the many, many deaths that have occurred, the mourning that can't be complete under the current conditions where we can't have wakes, we can't hug, laugh, cry, drink together, we can't attend burials and so forth. So there may be additional mourning that will need to come out after this is over. Um, we've all been penting up, you know, emotional storms inside us for the sake of getting along under tight circumstances. There might be a lot of emotional release and relief in unexpected ways afterwards. That's okay, you know. The third thing always to be aware of, especially uh, those with white privilege, is to watch out for snow blindness. Now, if you live in the north, you know what snow blindness is. If all you see is white, you go blind. The sun burns your cornea and you go blind. You can't see the big picture anymore. You can't see what's around you anymore. And while this has been a year of wake up, uh, you know, as Jalaluddin Rumi says, don't go back to sleep. Stay awake. Don't go snow blind. Be aware that communities of color might not be celebrating in exactly the same way that uh, communities of white privilege will be as this winds down. There's been a shameful inequity that's grown over the last year. And we do need to continue, all of us together, to pay attention to that. Before we close, too, I want to address another community very specifically that we haven't as of yet, and that is, of course, the healthcare community, which you yourself are part of. I know we've poured out our, our heartfelt sympathy for them and support for them, but is there a specific advice that you would offer them in, in finding the balance in that live, love, life that they are now faced with? Look, we know you're overworked and burned out and exhausted. We know you compartmentalize your stress because you're trained to, and that's how you get the job done. We know you've been working those overtime hours and taking extra shifts because the workload is overwhelming and relentless and you want to do your part. And please put yourself first. Uh, don't take those extra shifts. Go home and get caught up on your sleep. Please go play with your dog or your cat or your kids or your neighbor's kids a bit more when you can. Take some breaks because we will continue to need you and you got to take care of yourself. You know, the better you take care of yourselves, the better you can take care of us. And by the way, of course, thank you from the bottom of our collective hearts. Thank you. Well, before signing off with you, Valerie, I know you've been great to mention quite a lot of resources for folks listening. 
I want to make sure to ask you if there are any others you want to mention, and that is, of course, inclusive with our own comment section here on the YouTube channel. Um, I will say I'm happy to record to every single comment that comes in. I'll respond to you. I'd be happy to do that. Any other resources? Uh, best resource, honestly, it's yourself. It's the people you're close to. Turn to them. Laugh more. Find jokes. Keep sending those funny videos rather than doom scrolling so much. Find ways to bring micro doses of joy into your lives. Humor uh, elevates us. You know, safely hug and touch where you can. We don't get enough of that these days. And that's, uh, you know, above all, make little things, little plans for yourselves, things you can look forward to. You know, next weekend, a month from now. It's a great time to buy airfare for 18 months from now and plan your big dream trip. You can probably get it at half price. You know, have things to look forward to while we uh, continue to unwind from this pandemic. Well, once again, Valerie, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please stay safe and stay well. Take care. And thank you. In closing, I do want to share one last quote from this wonderful book, Love in the Time of Cholera, and that is this. He was still too young to know that the heart's memory eliminates the bad and magnifies the good, and that thanks to this artifice, we manage to endure the burden of the past. No doubt we will all suffer through something during this time, but there are a lot of lessons that will be learned and carried forth, many of which Valerie has talked about today, but specifically she focused on the joys of community and for that matter, the gift of compassion. And in that, even this romantic will tell you, well, if that's the stability Mr. Marquez is referencing, then in that, I can find great happiness. And I hope you do too. Until the next time, I'm Jeff Oppenheim. I thank you for joining me. Remember to make use of our comment section today because Valerie will answer any of your questions or concerns. Also, please subscribe, like, share. This is an important one to share with your friends and colleagues and loved ones. Until the next time, stay safe, stay well, and where you can, stay romantic.